Hey everybody, Tactic Angel, back on the PlayStation 5 to take a look at another premium ship in World of Warships Legends. This time we'll be looking at the Velos, a Tier 8 premium Greek pan-European destroyer. For this review, I'll start with some history, we'll move into analysis, discuss commanders, then run down the stats with you and finish off with some gameplay. If you want to skip around at all, you should see some time codes in the description to help you out. In February 1942, the 59th in a very limited run of just 175 Fletcher-class destroyers was laid down at the Boston Navy Yard. The ship would launch in June 1942 and commissioned into service in May 1943 as USS Charette. The Charette was named for George Charette, who was one of the participants in a planned, intentional scuttling of the USS Merrimack across the narrowest portion of the Santiago Harbor in hopes of trapping the Spanish fleet within during the Spanish-American War. All seven members of the skeleton crew were volunteers, and they were all awarded the Medal of Honor. Even though the Merrimack got shot out beneath the volunteers before they were able to get into the right position, the leader of the attack, Lieutenant Richmond Hobson, had a Gleaves-class destroyer named for him Gunner's first mate, Charette, was honored with this destroyer. The others were not similarly honored, though they all did get to be prisoners of war for a bit. In any case, Charette had a pretty active service life for the US Navy, earning 13 battle stars. She spent a lot of that time as part of the screening force for various fast carriers, but highlights of that service also include helping to sink a cruiser submarine alongside USS Fair, the identity of which is kind of up in the air regardless of what Wikipedia tells you. Following the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot, she was one of many ships flashing her lights to help guide aviators back to the carriers and also helping to pick up pilots who had to ditch prior to getting to the carriers. She sank a Japanese freighter off of Iwo Jima and captured the so-called hospital ship Tachibanamaru, which had suspiciously healthy troops aboard who became POWs. The Charette was placed into the reserve fleet in March 1946 and was decommissioned in January of the following year. She would see a second life, though, when she was one of seven Fletchers transferred to Greece for service in the Hellenic War Navy, or just the Hellenic Navy, whatever you want. Now, it may be something of a surprise to some, but Greece, while popularly credited as the birthplace of democracy, really hasn't been very democratic for most of the time since then. Athens was conquered by Alexander the Great of Macedonia. Then Rome became the driving influence in the Byzantine Empire before suffering several centuries under the Ottoman Empire. It wasn't until 1832, a bit over two millennia later, that Greece became a constitutional monarchy, which was certainly democratic-like, complete with referendums on who could be king. That proved to be a job that was harder to give away than you'd expect, resulting in Greece waffling between republic and monarchy a few times. During the sweet spot of World of Warships Legends, also known as World War II, when the Charette was off in the Pacific, Greece was actually occupied by the Axis and had a government in exile run out of Egypt. That might seem like a strange place to go, but at that point, Egypt was part of the British Empire. It was during this time that America, Britain, and the Soviet Union backed just about any rebel group that they could find, including the EAM and the ELAS, which were originally more your average freedom fighter, but thanks to some meddling from Moscow, were starting to become as much of a problem during the war as the other socialists they were supposed to be fighting, which led Britain and the United States to pull back support. Allied negotiations through the war would help to smooth this growing rift in Greece, but quickly following the war, the country would see three years of sometimes cold, often warm, and the certainly at times extremely hot civil war. While the communists, backed in part by the Soviet Union, but considerably more by the Yugoslavian dictator Tito, ultimately lost, that didn't mean that the Cold War wasn't quite a bit warmer on the sunny mountains and islands of Greece. While the constitutional monarchy was restored, which again was about as democratic as you'd consider Britain to be, at least on a normal day, when the political tide started to shift in the mid to late 1960s, in order to save democracy in Greece, a group of Greek officers arrested, detained, and put on trial their political adversaries and installed a military dictatorship, as one does. This military junta is usually called the regime of the colonels. 
Now, all of this might be a bit of a strange aside in a story about a boat. The Velos entered Greek service in July 1959. Seven years earlier, Greece had joined NATO. In eight years after she entered Greek service, democracy took a vacation. The Velos Cold War service was, like most Cold War vessels, pretty quiet compared to World War II. Even so, it's worth mentioning that Greece did, and to some degree still does, view Turkey with considerable mistrust for present and past behavior, giving them probably the undisputed title of the two NATO nations most likely to start shooting at each other ever since they both joined the alliance in the same year. The Velos would train, practice, and run exercises alongside other NATO countries, but otherwise didn't get into a lot of hot conflicts. Velos secured a place in history when, on May 23, 1973, she was on maneuvers with other NATO ships to the east of Italy, heading towards Sardinia when she turned north, diverting from her course, docking at Fiumicino, and refused to return to Greece. The crew had learned of the arrest of several naval officers earlier that day. Under the command of Nikolaos Papas, he had convened his officers and voted to seek asylum. Though the entire crew may well have joined them, Pappas ordered the majority of the crew back to Greece to avoid reprisal against their families and to spread the word of what had happened. The 32 of her crew who sought asylum didn't have to stay in Italy too long, just a bit over a year before the junta collapsed in July 1976. Following this, many of the men in asylum returned to service in the Navy, with Pappas himself eventually rising to the rank of Vice Admiral. Velos secured a place in Greek history without firing a shot, by drawing attention to the situation within Greece. Indeed, the record shows when she did turn north, she quoted from the preamble of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization that they are determined to safeguard the freedom, common heritage, and civilization of their people, founded on the principles of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. In that way, in addition to being a historic ship by the time that she even entered Greek service, the Velos was retired in 1991, following 38 years in service with the Greek Navy. But rather than being sent to the breakers, like over 170 other Fletchers, she was earmarked for preservation as a symbol of the struggle against dictatorship. And as that symbol, she has served as a museum ship from 2002 until today, with some brief interruptions. And that pretty much brings us to the end of the Velos history so far, now we can talk about her in-game. Velos is, of course, the fifth premium destroyer at Tier 8, and the second pan-European destroyer here. And as far as her general capabilities in the game, as a US destroyer transferred to European service, she retains some of the characteristics of both. Her strengths include some pretty strong torpedoes, if you can land them. They aren't as fast as the traditional pan-European fish, but when you do hit, they're quite a bit more noticeable. Though you don't have quite as many as on American ships, they do reload pretty quick, and in terms of speed, she definitely edges out better than her American counterparts, even if she isn't excessively fast. She also might be a bit more forgiving to some players who don't like running around in their destroyers in the open without a smokescreen. Velos comes with a smokescreen, in fact, more than the normal number of them, an engine boost and defensive fire AA to boot. Where Velos is probably going to rub people the wrong way is that she is a European destroyer that doesn't specialize in damage over time. And it's a Fletcher that isn't exactly a gunboat either. It can definitely hold her own to some degree, but just like Chung Mu, you really do need to lean into your torpedoes more than players of the Black, Fletcher, and Kid may enjoy. At any time, particularly if you're looking at this ship and functioning off of muscle memory, you might find Velos doesn't hang in there all that well due to her increasingly poor relative hit points, which aren't exactly hidden, but which certainly don't fit with the gunboat appearance. People who are going to enjoy Velos are probably more torpedo boat players, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, and I'd stand by that Chung Mu is probably the best indicator about whether or not you're going to enjoy this ship, except that the behavior of her torpedoes and available consumables are so different. Chung Mu largely does what torpedo boys do, it just doesn't do it to destroyers. She's got enough fish so that she can flood an area with them. Velos is pretty much the same torpedo DPM, but with a single rack 
that reloads very quickly and is going to have to hit a narrow or very narrow firing arc. And that's a risk reward payoff. Against particularly predictable players, you might land four or five torpedoes where most destroyers would be lucky to land two or three with just a single torpedo salvo. Problem is that most players are gonna make decisions on a moment to moment basis. And that's where what I call ship psychologist comes in. I say that because it's shorthand for considering what does the enemy see? How does the game look to him? Do I know some new variable that is going to pop up for him in the next few moments? How has he been playing so far? And how should I place the torpedoes considering all that? Because surely aiming for the white line, particularly when it's a thin white line, isn't always going to land hits. Even if you're somewhat good at this ship psychologist minigame, there are always two confounding variables, maybe more. But you don't know what he knows, which could make you miss by itself. And of course, how do we put this? There's a not statistically insignificant number of players who are intoxicated, just plain crazy, or for any number of reasons, just don't make reasonable decisions. So you'll have to be pretty good at this, lucky or even better, just plain psychic. So if you've got the interest and the confidence to make those shots, then I guess Velos is for you. And of course, if you're Greek, that doesn't hurt either. You gotta root for the home team after all, right? As far as commanders go, the Fletcher is a gunboat, so it may start out as sensible to go to a gunboat commander, Yezisfirsky. Where I don't know if this works is if you think you're going to use your smoke and blast away with an improved fire chance. Nope, not possible, and frankly, that's pretty surprising. It's not guaranteed not to work without improved fire chance, but at 5%, you can be blasting for an awful long time only to come away with nothing. On the bright side, you can increase the rate of fire, and against somewhat balanced destroyers, Fursky gives you the edge in a knife fight, but still plan on losing to ships like Schmaland, Kitakaze, Hayate. Actually, this list goes on longer than I expected, but it's a lot of ships. You'll be more competitive, yes, but there's only so much that you can do here with just the four guns. You will get slightly better smokes with Svirsky, and you have access to two types of radio positioning finding. I would choose Perceptive, personally. Stig Erikson is the torpedo guy, and you'd think the best choice for a ship that has only one torpedo launcher would be someone else, but that torpedo rack reloads pretty quickly. His base skill is gonna help you a bit in terms of damage per hit, and maybe even more importantly, he's got several abilities that will help you improve the torpedo reload even more. You've got a couple of extra speed abilities here, which are gonna help you go even faster. The downsides are really probably that any of the skills that really help with your torpedo performance will really further hamper your already not exceptional gun performance. Your last choice is the Dutch pan-European commander, Conrad Hilfrich, who I sometimes call Hilfreich, since that's the German word for helpful. There is not such a strong relationship here though. Helfrich is your only choice to be able to improve fire chance on your guns, and that's probably the best and nearly only reason to use him. In this configuration, I assume the game plan is basically blast away with three or four smoke screens with fully packed and hope that you get a fire that you can follow up with a flood. I imagine that this is the less reliable way of making damage just because an enemy paying any attention is unlikely to assume that a smoke screen is some normally occurring localized low visibility weather event and much more likely to consider it a reasonable position against which to plan to dodge against torpedoes particularly when that fog starts to shoot at him. You can also get the best AA out of this ship in that way, but that seems like a fool's errand for reasons that we're gonna hit on a bit later. Downsides are that you're basically giving up RPF. You may not be able to maneuver with a damaged engine or a broken rudder, and the damage reduction that comes with skills like Perceptive. As we jump into stats, we'll look at Velos against most tier eight destroyers, and plan on hearing a lot of references to other Fletcher class ships as well. For survivability, Velo starts with just 17,100 hit points, which isn't a lot. It is the same amount as you have on Chung Mu, and to spell it out explicitly, it's about 16% less than average destroyers at the tier. 
While this is 400 more than Fletcher and Black, the ship is going to feel a bit less powerful tier for tier than other ships of the same class because Fletcher and Black are closer to the statistical average for tier 7. And if you want to back that all the way up to Kid, you have comparatively even less life to play with if you want to get into those knife fights. And yes, the number for Kid here is before you consider that she comes with two heals. Armor situation is pretty normal, both for destroyers in general, but also destroyers at the tier, and as usual, no torpedo reduction. The other half of being a knife fighter would be the performance of the guns. You've got four 5-inch guns that range out to 10.9 kilometers, which is close to average. The 2.5 second reload is very fast and does a pretty good job of making up for the fifth turret you might have expected on this ship. In fairness, that is one second faster than Chung Mu, but the damage is 100 less at just 1800. She comes with a familiar 5% fire chance for American 5-inch guns. It's notable, again, that you can't improve this without taking the base commander choice. So between your fire chance and the reload, that gives Velos just a bit more than half the fire starting potential of Smalland, with Velos being about 20% worse than average. Not very good if you're looking to play the damage over time game. Your HE damage ends up being about 12% above average, and you could switch over to the 2100 point AP damage for certain targets, and that may result in more damage, but it is average AP DPM. Jumping over to torpedoes, you're also missing a rack here with just one quintuple launcher. That said, it comes with the fastest reload at the tier, just 60 seconds, and thanks to a strong 19,000 damage per torpedo, you end up with a better direct damage than Smalland, as well as better damage over time. You place just behind Chung Mu there, in spite of that ship having torpedoes that do similar damage and twice as many of them. The 10 kilometer range is on the short side of average, and at 66 knots, that's nowhere close to the warp speed torpedoes that you're used to on pan European ships. Again, they're the same speed as Chung Mu's deep water fish. If you aren't picking up what I'm throwing down here, I'm trying to tell you, you really need to think about Chung Mu when considering this, though Chung Mu does come with a reload booster. Anyway, 1.4 kilometer detectability is gonna give you about average reaction time, but like other pan European torpedoes, that can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on whether your enemy can slow down, speed up, or turn in time to get out of the way, or if they're not left with enough room to dodge. Coming next to AA, Velos is surprisingly bad here. Even though the rating is average, you're going to end up with just 105 damage per second outside of your air detectability range. But this is 25 points less than Chung Mu, in fact, you have the worst AA of any of the Fletchers, which is just surprising, let's say. I would be remiss if I didn't point out that you have access to DFAA though, so you will have the opportunity to have relatively good AA, still being a bit less than Smalland. I'll be real honest though, if I were playing a Corveda, I'd still fly right at this thing though. Maybe the maneuverability of Velos would make that not such a great idea. 38 knots is tied with Chung Mu, again, for fastest Fletcher class destroyer, though it's barely above average for a tier 8 destroyer. 620 on the turning circle is 10 meters from being the best at the tier, and the 3.9 second rudder is pretty good as well. Concealment for Velos is not bad, though the 100 meters better than average isn't going to be all that noticeable. 3.5 kilometers from air is exactly average, and the 2.6 kilometer firing penalty from smoke is both average for the tier and typical of American 5-inch guns. But at least you can look to your pan-European brothers to the north and say, at least I have smoke. Speaking of, we should jump into consumables. You have a damage control party, as all ships do, and it's typical of destroyers. 5 second duration, 40 second recharge. We've already mentioned two of these. First, the defensive anti-aircraft consumable, which is typical DFAA, 200% damage for 40 seconds and a two and a half minute reload. That gives you pretty decent AA for a destroyer. Nothing fierce and the DPS you'll reach is still low for a cruiser, so don't get your hopes up. 
You also have smoke and surprisingly three of them. They have a nice long 127 second duration with two minutes and 40 seconds between use. The one we haven't talked about is a speed boost. You've been able to see it the whole time. It's nothing special, 8%, two minutes of use, three minutes on the reload. I don't know, if the Chengmu chooses different consumables, maybe you can lord that over them. And finally, we'll get into the battle. We're gonna be on Land of Fire. Obviously, we're gonna be in the Velos. Chosen to run the Velos with its historic camo rather than its fancy fancy ancient greek camo i really like that camo to be completely honest but i have those camos turned off and i'm not going to turn on just for one ship in any case once the game gets going i'm going to go ahead and put my commander up on the screen you can see we're running with stig erickson to be fair i was given a hard time by a swede about my pronunciation of him so we're giving it a shot anyway we're on the seaside. As the game starts up, we're going to begin by going up towards sea. We are on the weak side, but it wouldn't hurt to see if we can't get this cap for free. It's very possible that the enemy team has also abandoned this side. And we wouldn't mind getting it for free. In fact, you'll find that free is consistently a, a price I'm willing to pay for a lot of things. And in this case, we're going to go ahead and just put ourselves in. You can see we're falling around the nearest indicator. And that's what I mean by RPF, if you hear me say that. It's this little thing up here telling me the direction of the nearest ship. I am open to the idea that a destroyer will jump in here. You saw that there are a couple of choices in terms of destroyers on the enemy team. Uh, the one that we really don't want to see is the Friesland. And we got really lucky because there's two of them. And as far as I can tell, that very well could be the closest target over there, the Nebraska. And he's not going to get here before I cap this, so that'll be a nice way to start the game, and we'd have paid exactly what we wanted for this, which is nothing. And you can see we put out a widespread, or what passes for a widespread in this particular boat. Uh, I probably could have gone with the, the more narrow spread. Uh, in fact, I probably should have. You can see most of those are gonna hit the island, and we didn't get enough density in there to actually make those hard for him to dodge. They did get all the way out there. And as we sneak behind an island, we do take a couple of hot shots. You can see our 127s are struggling to pen the Nebraska. If I hit him in the forward face of that flight deck, I want to say I can pen that. And I can pen other areas of the superstructure. Just aiming is hard, you know? Particularly when you're far away. Looks like we've got a little bit of aerial attention. We do have a carrier on the enemy team. Those don't look like carrier planes though. That looks like the Nebraska leaving me some gifts. And here we have our first glance at the Friesland, obviously there are two of them on the enemy team, and one of them is covering the middle of the map. At least it looks like he should probably get that. And it looks like they're doing the uh, combined arms thing. One of the guys in the division is running the Enterprise, while you've got Friesland queued up, which is the best AA destroyer at the tier, so kind of engineers an advantage. It's not like everybody doesn't do it. You don't see a lot of Kagero, Suzuya, and Kaga combinations out there. Z44 is a bit less dangerous. It does not have sonar, so if I needed to, I could duck into smoke screen. Um, for a minute here, I think 
that I'm gonna get away by just driving over here. You can see I'm still probably being spotted by folks in the middle. And if we just keep driving, uh, that that proves to be a limited time offer, so we're safe again. And now the Z44 smoke screen is actually working in my favor because somebody either spotted the Nebraska or he shot. And what looks like our 30th shot, we managed to get a fire, which um, statistically is not all that far off of average. At 5%, considering the average battleship's fire reduction chance, it's somewhere between 30 and 40 shots that it would typically take to average one fire. So short story is ships have a certain amount of fire resistance. Some of them have special fire resistance like Yamato. And this is one reason why an unmodified 5% fire chance to me doesn't seem like a great deal to just uh, spend my time sitting in a smoke screen praying for that fire. Oh, we get another fire, which that one should stick for a while. We are still being spotted while shooting. I assume that that is from the Z44. And even a second fire. So that's actually very good. Now playing ship psychologist, my thoughts are if he rams himself face first into that island, that's not particularly a bad outcome for me. But if he wants to press his luck, he'll have to go around. Once again, we see some aircraft coming in to attack us. I'm not using DFAA against an American hybrid because it doesn't matter if I shoot those down. I just assume dodge. The more narrow torpedoes prove to be a bit harder to dodge. Now there are going to still be gaps in there that he could probably squeeze his boat through, but you know, when you're already maneuvering and torpedoes appear in front of you, your battleship, sometimes there's not all that much you can do other than just don't take the chance in the first place. We pop up on the other side of the Z-44. It looks like he's not paying too much attention to us, which is probably not going to be the best outcome for him. When given the opportunity, certainly these guns can put out a, a decent amount of damage. Um, you are somewhere in the middle of the pack. I would prefer to be in this ship rather than Z-44 in a gunfight, but... I would definitely prefer to have his torpedoes. I guess I'd actually prefer to be in Velos most of the time versus Z44, but at least that one is definitely a torpedo boat where this is, uh, Problem solved, sir. this is just weird. So he has taken our cap. We will go ahead and get it back and start to move towards the middle. Obviously we have two destroyers left on the enemy team. It's still very much an even game in terms of of ships and cap control. Once we get this, we should start to make up that point difference, but we're going to have to be a little bit careful because they have two really, really competitive destroyers that are going to be very good at exerting cap control against our destroyers. So looks like we have a few more aircraft here. We're gonna go the dodge route. Those look like they were launched just a little bit too close to me. I think that that Republic is going to start to move forward. And that is why I uh, did not pay attention to the line. I've chosen to use a widespread because I'm not putting all my eggs in one basket. And with his HP situation, I really just need to hit once and I would be very happy to hit once. And there you go. There you go. Uh, in the meantime, we do dodge some carrier-based aircraft. Velo certainly has the maneuverability to do this. 
uh, as well as any other Fletcher. And we're going to stay pretty close to this island because we want to be able to uh, avoid some of those extra torpedoes if you had any planes left. I get thrown off a little bit here because I'm sonar. And obviously it's that Friesland over there. So it makes a good amount of sense to go ahead and shoot him because otherwise he's just going to be spotting for the Musashi anyway. And I'd like to think that the Musashi has better things to shoot at, but I'm just... Just not going to take that chance. It doesn't seem to pay off for me when I think that way. But I want to lose my spot here, so I'm going to use the first of my three smoke screens, uh, given the amount of time left in the game. I'm probably not going to get to use all of them. I'm just taking a guess here. But I think this guy is not going to want to be here, because I wouldn't want to be here either. And I probably don't want to charge down a smoke screen. Smoke screen set. So we're going to guess he's going to go out. Now this is one of the things about ship psychologists though. I think that's a great idea, but it gets a little bit tricky when there's an aircraft carrier and it gets even more tricky when the aircraft carrier brings a set of planes that are going to cause the person to dodge a different way. So all of this ends up not really mattering all that much because I didn't take into account the aircraft coming in and I certainly didn't take into account that he was going to flood to death. So we'll get those torpedoes back pretty quick. Nothing to worry about. We still want to try to take back B if we can. That will help us a little bit in terms of not bleeding points. The thing is that uh, this is still not great for me. And obviously we're getting attacked by the CV at this point. We did pop the DFAA. You can see how effective it is. Now, keep in mind, I have lost some of my AA probably by this point, so it could be better than this. Still doesn't seem that good, though. So, predictably, we end up against the Friesland in the middle. Uh, he has a bit more hit points than you would want, and he does about 50% more DPM than I do. So this is, uh, this is not going to work. He obviously immediately repairs his front gun, and I don't have smoke to save me, and he has sonar, so it'd probably be a bad idea even if I did. But in any case, uh, that, that was a fairly predictable result. We throw, in desperation, our last bit of torpedoes out there just to see if we can hit him. That's, that's not going to happen. And that's actually one of the places where you might want to widespread. One might say, Tactic Angel, why did you do it? it? Seemed good for the points game, and sometimes you do get a little bit greedy when you got those four kills. Just wouldn't mind getting one more. Still, this is going to go on to a victory here. Uh, the enemy carrier is in trouble in terms of having a cruiser a bit closer to him than he would probably like. I guess that's the game I chose to uh, feature. Honestly, I uh, didn't have as much time as I might have liked to otherwise work on a video for this update. If everything's going as planned, I am in Europe as you are watching this video. And anyway, closing thoughts on Velos. Well, it's a Fletcher class ship, so it's always going to have a bit of a place in my heart for that reason. And you can also add to it, it's got a pretty interesting history after her US service. And of course, it's fantastic that Greece has chosen to preserve her. Unfortunately, this is a video game, and maybe as far as Fletchers are concerned, I'm spoiled for choice. But this one would take last place in the class that I'd be interested in playing. I think a lot of other people are going to end up in the same boat, at least in the sense that we'd prefer to be playing something else. Velos is pleasantly fast, and you saw in that game my ability to get around the field to take back and challenge different caps. Most destroyers can do that. And versus the very similar Chung Mu, I may be able to technically hit a destroyer with a Velos, but between narrow and very, very narrow torpedo spreads, it's not realistic at the ranges where you do battle with other destroyers. So for my money, if I can't really effectively fight with them, I just assume stay further away. And I think in practice, the torpedoes on this ship ask too much of the average player who's just trying to have fun. But hey, if you're psychic or want to mark this up to a skill issue, then have right at it. I'll take my low visibility deep water torpedoes if I want to torpedo something I can hit and avoid most gunfights and what otherwise looks to me like a gunboat. 
And then of course, if I want to play a gunboat version of the Fletcher, I'll just hop onto any one of them that flies the Stars and Stripes. So for me, Velos is a little disappointing. Maybe I just don't get it. Let me know what you think down in the comments, and of course, I'll see you on the next one. You know, if I get to Europe and back okay. <laughs>